So yesterday we were lucky enough to have uh, Topeak Nair talk to us about a lot of the super resolution. He was able to use super resolution to answer his questions there about those receptors in the uh, synaptic cleft. And it was a nice example of how you can use these techniques to actually, you know, put forward a hypothesis and actually, you know, follow through with it and do some really, really fabulous work like you were able to see yesterday. Uh, you know, I, I, I realize your skill level with microscopes probably isn't as great as mine, but that work you saw yesterday, that was absolutely phenomenal work. That is very technically challenging and very hard, and, and I was uh, really very, very, very impressed by his work. It was very, very top-notch, without a doubt. So you're very lucky to experience that and uh, very lucky to be able to talk to that gentleman. Okay. So we're going to talk about super resolution turf, frap, and fret. Uh, the reason I talked about confocal first is confocal is a pretty good basis to get into some of these things. These are now a little bit more specialized techniques that you see quite a bit. I think I mentioned quite a few of these when we talked about trends in microscopy. And we'll just talk about them again. It's just the kind of thing so you know about them, you're aware of them. And again, if you see your research project and you say, wait a second, maybe I can use something like this. So just a, an introduction to these techniques that you might be able to use in your future work, okay? Just so you're aware of them. Okay, so I based the super resolution part of this presentation on this uh, course I found. There's a lot of online courses like, like I'm giving you right now. I was able to get material from a lot of these different things. So literally anything I talk about, you could find a lot more online for sure. Cause it's, you know, we all know it's pretty amazing what's on the internet these days. Okay, again, my favorite thing we've been talking about, the idea of resolution. It's all about resolution because what is everything? NA is everything, okay. It just comes back to this again and again and again. You gotta be able to tell two different things apart for anything to work right. Okay, so I gave the example today of the railroad tracks coming from outer space. It would look like one line, but eventually when you get the resolving power, you would see the two tracks, right? Okay. It's very important. That's why I've mentioned it so many times. Okay. And we went through this before. We talked about the math resolution. Somebody asked me a question about why resolution got smaller, and it, I was just, you know, think jet lag or in a daze or whatever, but you want resolution to be smaller because the smaller it is, that means the, 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 the smaller distance to, between the two objects you can resolve. So the whole idea is to get the resolution number smaller, okay? So I made a mistake if I explained it to somebody I remember the other day. It's tough when you're on a plane for all those hours. Anyway, I feel better now though. Okay, so I think uh, Deepak mentioned this a little bit uh, when his talk yesterday, but we were always taught in, uh, that the resolution limit of the optical microscope is only 220 nanometers. Like if you ran the physics, that you really couldn't get any better than a resolution of 220 nanometers. So what that means is you cannot distinguish two objects from each other that were less than 220 nanometers apart. That was considered the, the physical you know, limit of of optical microscopy resolution, and that's what I was taught. Just like things always change in science. Like when I started in science, working on my PhD back in 1992, we were taught that the, there were 144,000 genes. That was the number. I still remember it really well in my head. There's 144,000 genes in the human body. Well, as time went on, uh, towards the end of my PhD, I remember we were taught, well, 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 that's wrong. There's 100,000 genes. Okay, that was what was known. We were told it was 100,000, that's sure, that's what you're taught, that's the way it is. Well, now that everything's sequenced, does anybody know the number, roughly? It's right around, I think, 28, 26, anyway, I've read different things, 26, 27, 28,000 genes, 29,000 genes, something like that I've read. My guess is it'll change again. But things always change in science. And this was a very interesting problem for a lot of years. Like, wow, it'd be nice if we could do better than this, but the physics says, no, nah, we can't do any better than this, okay? But, of course, there's some smart people out there, and physicists were saying, you know, around 220 nanometers, 0.2 microns. But thankfully, some smart folks figured out how to break this limit, okay? And, of course, we have to pay homage to them for their work and, and being able to do this for us. 
So these three gentlemen here uh, received the Nobel Prize back in 2014. Eric Betzig, Stefan Hell, and uh, William Warner. Okay, they all came about the came about the idea a little differently how to do it, but they came up with the same kind of answer to break this, this, this resolution limit. Okay? And obviously it was a big deal, it was a big finding, because they won a Nobel Prize for it. And their Nobel Prize, you can see on the bottom here, was basically for the development of super resolved fluorescence microscopy. So these are the people that we can thank for uh, Dr. DePeak's talk, or his, his talk yesterday because without their work, he wouldn't have been, been able to do his work. Okay, so there was two different ways that, that came up with how to overcome this limit. One was super resolution by single molecule imaging, and the other one was super resolution by spatially patterned excitation. Okay, and we're going to get into these a little bit. Okay, so read this for a second. Hard to read with me walking in front of it, but still. Okay. So basically what it means is this. Let's say, let's say this was an art class instead. Okay. And your assignment is to draw a picture of me. Okay. So you have your pencil or pen or paintbrush or whatever, and you'd start to draw me, right? Well, what if I told you that you have to draw me, but I give you a pin? and I give you a little bit of ink. And you have to take that pin, you have to dip in that ink, and you can't draw a line, you have to do a dot. So you have to go like dot, 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 dot. And you have to make a picture of me by just going, you know, dot, 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 Okay, it would take you an awful long time, obviously. But you could do it. It would be hard, it would be very difficult, but you could actually go dot, 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 and take pictures of me. Correct? Okay. So that whole slide, what it showed, basically, the idea of super resolution is you're not really looking at the, I guess, the entire object. You're looking at the little single molecule fluorescent molecules that actually are making up that object. So you're going to look at those individual dots, basically. And I think we saw some of that with his talk yesterday, how you saw it was sort of dotty. You know, because you're looking at single molecules here, okay? So if we could keep looking at the single molecules, we'd be okay. All right, well, while we're waiting, let me switch topics for a second. Uh, have any of you been to the U.S. before? You have? You have? Did you visit any cities in particular? Seattle. Seattle, very nice, very pretty. Okay. Chicago, Chicago pretty big. Yeah. Was it like here or a little bit different, you think? Mm -hmm. Very different? Yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, like where I'm from, and I think, you know, Sregith obviously came to Cleveland. The part of the country I'm in, everybody ever heard of Niagara Falls? Okay, that's a real, like if you come to my part of the country, like I obviously work with a lot of foreign students and stuff, I always recommend to them. Hey, come to Niagara Falls. Take a look at Niagara Falls because it's a really nice, very different kind of place. You see the amount of water going over those falls. It's like, wow, that is absolutely crazy because it's like a giant river just running over a falls. Okay, so that's something if you come to America, you definitely want to take a look at. Uh, the other thing you'd like to, I think if you get a chance in America to go see would be Washington, D.C., our capital. Uh, we have a lot of monuments and stuff. Oh, okay. Okay. We'll, we'll get off that topic, and we'll get back on this topic. Okay. But anyway, the idea of you could basically, it, okay, so it is thus conceivable that super-resolution fluorescence can also be achieved by determining the position of each fluorescent probe or dot in a sample with high precision. So if you could put all the dots back together, you could build the object again. Okay, so super resolution microscopy by single molecule images. So what you're doing then here is you're using fluorescent molecules that you're able to either turn on and turn off. Okay, they can be turned on, turn off, 
and at different time points. Okay. And these two techniques to use this are called storm and palm. I know storm's a Nikon. Nikon uses storm. Palm, I can't remember the top of my head which companies use it, but I know Nikon's a storm one. Okay, so let's take a look at this. So what it is, is again, you have all these dots, right? So they, they put in a beam, and the fluorescent molecule is a little different, but these three dots get activated, okay? You then image those three dots. Okay, it, it sends it out to the, the, the detector, the, the camera. And then next, <coughs> it shows where those three dots are. Like I said, it sends it out to the camera. Then you photo bleach those. And by photo bleach, you get those out of the equation. You, you bleach them so they're gone. So now those three dots are gone, and you activate a different set of dots. And you do the same thing again and again and again. So now you're able to look at these three dots. These other three dots are gone. So you just keep building up different fluorescent picture on top of different fluorescent picture on top of different fluorescent picture. But the thing is, is the dots are so small, you've beat that, you've basically beat that theoretical limit because the dots can be closer than the 220 nanometers, okay? Does that make sense how it works? Because before, you would just see it as like one dot. But by doing something like this, there's actually many dots in here. By being able to turn them off and turn them on, you can break that into to multiple dots that are beyond the limit that physics told us we could look at. So it was like a clever go around to be able to beat that diffraction limit. A lot of computing power, a lot of other things came into play, but, but a very clever way to go about it. So the idea is, again, you would have your you know, filaments or whatever you're looking at. You would activate a, a subset of different probes. And you know, by going through this again and again and again and again, and if you have enough dots, the density, then you can build back up the picture. Okay? And again, you're able to get around the theoretical uh, limit of what an optical microscope can look at. So you saw something like this from, from the talk yesterday. Okay, the density. Well, if you only have like you know, 20 molecules or 25 dots, it's going to be hard to paint the whole picture in, right? So you've got to have density. You've got to have a lot of dots. You've got to have a lot of fluorescent molecules. But if you have it, you see, you can just keep building up the image, building up the image, building up the image to something like this. So a confocal, which is a fabulous and great image, normally, we blow it up, though, really can be resolved because you can increase the resolving power to get something like this. So... Again, things that were hidden from us in research that we couldn't see because this was the best tool we had available now are much better resolving power. And then, okay, let me ask a question here. What, okay, so optical microscope, we can get down to this kind of resolving power. What kind of microscope can we even get higher resolving power? We're going to be talking about here in a day or two. Somebody's going to come in and talk about electron microscope, exactly. The electron microscope can give you even better resolving power, but the drawback of the electron microscope, the samples have to be dead. You can't do live. Okay? But the, the detail, I'm sure all of you have seen probably a picture of an electron micrograph or something. The, the resolution is just unbelievable. But again, you can't work in a living system. It's much harder to, to tell things apart with an electron microscope. Like here, we, we have all these techniques where we can label something green, label something red. You can also do that kind of stuff in an electron microscope but it's much, much more difficult. What they do there is they usually label things with gold particles, like tiny gold particles of different size. So instead of different colors, you can use different size particles. But the technique is very challenging and very hard and very time consuming. Whereas these kind of techniques are much easier, much, you, you know. Same like Say that again? Same, same kind of change for the both, uh, both kinds of uh, microscopes? Yeah. Uh, a little bit different. For instead, there, there's some kind of special fluorophores quite often. But anyway, uh, Palm, just showing, you know, one of the other techniques, pretty similar to Storm. I mean, they're all in that same kind of idea. But you can see, again, the, the resolution just gets dramatically increased by building up the dots. Okay. So let's look at this one, Stead. This is the one I've used before, uh, the institution I'm at. We have Stead. I've done Storm, too, but not, not a whole lot. But this one, uh, Stead. 
And uh, the one I use is Leica. It's a Leica microscope with stud. This one, it's the same kind of idea in a way. But what it is, is it uses two lasers to achieve, achieve super resolution. You have an excitation laser to excite the fluorescent molecule here, an excitation beam, and then a depletion laser to prevent excitation allowing no signal. So what it is basically, you have this excitation here, and you have a, another laser that will come in called a depletion beam, and you could put it around this. And if you could eventually make this hole smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, eventually you can get beyond the super resolution. You can get beyond the, the theoretical resolution. And what we call this in America, I don't know if you have them here, we call these like donut. This would be a donut shape. You have donuts here? You have stuff like donuts, but you actually have the donut with the hole in the middle? Okay. Yeah. They're real popular at home. Like breakfast, you go and people come into work and bring in like a big box of donuts or something. Okay, so take a read of this. This is a pretty good explanation of what, what, what I was trying to say there. So basically the idea is if you make that, like I said, that donut tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter, the fluorescing spot becomes smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, then you get past that diffraction limit. So another way to do the same thing. Okay. So if you make the donut hole smaller and smaller, eventually you get to the point where it's below the diffraction limit and you break the resolution limit and you can solve rate by having a whole bunch of donuts to eat. Okay. They're tasty too. And then this time of year we have something like in the Catholic we have, uh, we have Ash Wednesday coming up. So Ash Wednesday, we start to fast, which actually is today. Ash Wednesday is today, actually. So we, we fast before that. But the day before that, because it's Ash Wednesday, yesterday was what we call Fat Tuesday. So Fat Tuesday, you just go crazy. You just eat everything under the sun. And we have these things called, uh, like I'm Polish. My background's Polish. We have these things called punchkis. They're like donuts filled with cream and jelly and I mean they're just off, off the chart like I mean just you know make you fat as anything if you ate them all the time but on Fat Tuesday you just eat them like crazy eat all this other food like crazy and then today we would start our Lent so today we you know behave ourselves and be good again but yesterday we just go at it like crazy okay so anyway the same kind of idea more or less with the dots is with the confocal all these dots here are going to get excited so they would get excited, they'd turn red, and they would fluoresce, okay? But instead, we'd bring that donut around, we would just excite these couple molecules, these would not be, and then we'd only excite just a couple dots at a time, okay? So we could move around and excite it as we went, and then the computer builds the image back up. And again, the idea of confocal is great, it's fabulous, but it's gone beyond. Okay. Okay. Turf microscopy. Uh, again, this is a very specialty thing. We have, I know there's one at the Cleveland Clinic, which is in Cleveland, which is close to where I work, Case Western. And then we have one at uh, where I work, Case Western Reserve. I tried selling these in the past. They were really hard to sell because the application's so narrow that unless that person was working on something very specific, it was really hard to sell. And what the application is with turf is this, is if you're looking at like say, proteins that interact with like the extracellular matrix, like, like uh, integrins. I don't know, if, does anybody here know what integrins are? You ever heard of integrins? Well, integrins are molecules that are on the cell membrane, okay? On the, the outer cell membrane. And the integrin comes in an alpha and a beta form. And what they do is these integrins usually act, interact with the extracellular matrix, which is, you know, the collagens and the fibronectins and the, the other molecules that, that lay outside the cell. And what happens is if a cell is on, say, fibronectin, the integrin will interact with it. It'll, sell, it'll send a signal through the integrin 
to tell the cell what to do. It's like, hey, you're on fibronectin, do this. Or, hey, you're on collagen, do this. So a lot of times this, the way the cells behave is determined by what's out the side of the cell. And a lot of that is, is directed through these integrin type receptors, okay? So I used to work with integrins. I did my PhD on integrins. And integrins are like, again, on the edge of the, like the, the cell membrane of the cell. So when you culture cells, you know, a monolayer, that part where the cell's sticking down, often that's full of integrins and other signaling molecules, like focoadhesion kinase is a big one you may have heard of, some others. But that, but that interface of where the cell interacts with the matrix or the cell interacts is a very narrow area, very thin area. So what TERF does is TERF comes in with the laser and it bounces the laser off the cover slip. Okay, so it comes in, here's your cover slip. The laser comes in and it bounces. Like you have to set up the angle just right. There's like a knob, well at least the old one I used to sell was a knob and you get this angle just right. And what it does actually, it actually produces a wave from the laser hitting here. So it's not the laser actually exciting it, but it's this wave called a, I can never quite say it right, effervescent wave, okay? So this effervescent, effervescent wave goes up here and excites these fluorescent molecules that you've maybe labeled your integrin with or focal adhesion kinase or something with. So you don't have the laser hitting it, you have this little wave hitting it. So the signal is amazing versus the noise. There's like no background. I mean, it's like when you tune this angle just right, like you'd be looking at a microscope, looking at a microscope, and then it's like, bam, just, I mean, it just, it just pops. It's really amazing to see it. It's almost like, you know, you go out at night, uh, I mean, you guys seem to have an awful lot of lights here, but if you go out in the where it's really, really dark, like out where I live is pretty dark. We don't have much lights. I live out in the country pretty far. And when it's really, really dark, you know, the stars are really, really bright. So when this works just right, it is like, like bright stars on a dark night. It's amazing how nice it is. So let's take a look at a couple images of that. But it's called turf. The drawback being, though, it only works very, very, very close to the cover slip. So if you want to study the nucleus, or if you want to study some other stuff, you can't really use TERF. It's made for this sort of particular application. That's why it was not the easiest thing in the world to sell, because if the person wasn't doing that technique, they wouldn't buy one. Okay. So again, this idea of you have all these molecules that are tagged in a cell, let's say, but the effervescent field only travels so far from the cover slip, so the only molecules are going to get excited are right next to the cover slip. Okay. So very close to the cover slip application. But if that's what you're after, it's amazing. So again, it's a very niche kind of instrument. Do you know what niche means? I keep using the word niche, like very narrow. Yeah, OK, OK. Uh, so within 100 nanometers of the cover glass, so things that are right on the cover glass. So very good for cell surface kind of molecules. Integrins, of course, my, one of my favorite molecules, of course, from spending six years at lab studying them. Uh, and then we could look at this. But, but you get this kind of picture right here. And there's a video you can take a look at to, to see how this actually works. Okay. okay, FRAP. This is another one you'll hear. Like, people love to use these acronyms. Like, they like to use the, you know, the first letter to describe the technique. So this is photo recovery or fluorescent recovery after photo bleaching. So sometimes bleaching is what you want to do. And a lot of times we talk about, no, you don't want to do it, but for this technique, you want to do it. Uh, I worked with a couple labs. I used to do some of this stuff, not very often. I think just, you know, I just didn't work with the right people, but I've done it. It's pretty cool. It's actually really cool to watch it. Okay, so again, FRAP's a technique to study, like, fluorescently tagged molecules on a cell membrane. A lot of times for kinetics, like you want to see how fast things are moving in a cell membrane, it's like a kinetic kind of study. So the, again, very niche, sort of a narrow window, but again, just want to expose you to these things so you know about them. If you, know, if you end up studying something like this, then you, know, you go, oh, maybe I should use FRAP, okay? So what happens is, is you are basically got the membrane, you've got it labeled with fluorescent <laughs> molecules, you're going to go in and you're going to bleach it in a certain spot. So if you bleach it in a certain spot, now remember, the membrane's dynamic. The membrane is moving. The membrane's, you know, alive. 
So now you have this dark hole where you bleached it. But you can then measure how long does it take for these molecules to move back in to replace that hole. Like how long, and you can measure the kinetics of molecules, the kinetics of receptors, how they move in the membrane, and things like that. So, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a great technique if that's, you know, the question you're trying to answer. So again, to study cell membrane diffusion, kinetics, and protein binding in the cell membrane. So a schematic of it. You have your cell membrane. It's all labeled with all this fluorescence. You're going to come in with the light, strong and hard, bleach it, bleach a hole. The, the molecules start moving back in. The fluorescent lead tag ones start moving back in. You're taking pictures. You're taking a time lapse. You can measure this. Okay, you can measure this rate of diffusion. So a way to look at cell membrane dynamics is what FRAP's really nice for. And with the lasers we had back then, I'm sure maybe even better, you can make a little, like you could draw any kind of, you don't have to be a circle, you could draw a little square, a little, you know, line or whatever. If it helped with your application, you could draw different bleaching kind of uh, mechanisms or different areas, I guess you should say. Okay, FRAP. Okay, this is like co-localization on steroids, in a way. Like steroids make everything better, everything stronger. So FRET is a technique where you're determining if two proteins are co-localized, co but it goes farther than that. Like when we talked about co-localization before, we basically said that just because they co-localize doesn't necessarily mean they interact, okay? Because they can be close, but they just might not be close enough to actually interact, even though they're very close. Well, FRET takes that to a different level. FRET takes that to the level where they have to be found within the same 250 to 500 nanometers of each other, the two proteins, okay? The proteins themselves are much smaller than the resolution limit of fluorescence. And is there any way we can use fluorescent microscopy tech where specific protein-protein interactions occur? And yes, the answer is with FRET. Okay, so I'm going to talk about this technique. Uh, it's not the easiest technique. There's actually a man in Virginia, uh, Van Espani, or I just can't quite remember his name exactly right now, Amani something, at the University of Virginia. He is like Mr. Fret. He pretty much came up with the technique, runs a big workshop on it. Uh, it's not the easiest thing in the world to do. But if it's something you have to do, it'd definitely be worth probably going to his workshop for a week if you're going to do it a lot. I mean, it's not like a, this isn't a technique like, oh, let's do fret tomorrow. It's not, no, it's a, it's a challenge. It's a challenge, okay? It's a challenge. And it's, anytime something like that's a challenge, it's good to find a lab that does it to help you, okay? Uh, just like yesterday's talk where he said he found this paper from, what, 1979, something to do with electron microscopy, and it saved him a ton of time doing something. Again, if you have a lab down the hall or even at a close institution that does it, go, go take advantage of it. You know, use it. Use them. You know, science is a, a team. Okay. So what is FRET? It's forced to resonance energy transfer. That's where we get our FRET. It's a distant-dependent photophysical process. It occurs between floor, two floor fours separated by a distance of less than 100 angstroms. So... They have to be super, 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 super close for this to work, okay? And you can measure this in uh, fluorescence microscopy. I have a lab upstairs for me that does a lot, of, a lot of fret kind of stuff. They do the microscope part, but they also do, like, plate readers and stuff, okay? Fret can be used to report on the proximity of molecules over much smaller distances than can be resolved by standard fluorescence or even super resolution approaches. Because, look, you're in the angstrom world, okay? You're tiny, tiny, tiny distances where this works. Does it need to be touching? It's pretty much touching, yes. I mean, I can't tell you if it's actually touching, but it's, it's got to be that close to work, which is about as close to touching as you can get. Okay. So what it is, it's a sensitive reporter of protein-protein interactions. Okay. Okay. So here's what it is. This is how it works.
Okay, so we've been talking about fluorescence, right? And we kept talking about you have to excite the molecule and then you have to catch the emission, right? So excitation, emission. Well, instead of calling it excitation, we can call it absorption. Absorption, excitation, or absorption, yeah, excitation, same thing. Okay, so in FRET, you have this overlap. So what it means is the, the donor molecule, so these are pairs of pro these are pairs of fluorescent proteins. They work in pairs. You have to have two of them. They're called FRET pairs, okay? Some of the FRET pairs are FITSI, something called TMR, FITSI, FITSI. We have another, the one we usually use a lot is probably CFP, YFP. I use this one. I've done FRET in my lab with, with these two molecules, okay? They're fluorescent proteins like we're talked about on the first day. But the way they work is that, okay, you have the one called the donor, okay, its emission, so it gets excited, right, it gets excited, it has its ex excitation wavelength over here, it gets excited, it has an emission spectrum. Its emission spectrum is enough energy because they're so, so, so close that it can excite the acceptor molecule. So it excites the acceptor molecule, and then the acceptor molecule, because it's excited, can then emit. Okay? This cannot happen unless these things are super, super, super close, because this isn't much energy. But the pairs have to be chosen correctly. They have to be close enough where the excitation, or the emission of this one, is close enough and has enough energy to excite the other molecule, okay? So you, instead of using a laser to excite this other molecule, you're using another fluorescent protein, its emission spectrum, to, to, to actually turn the other one on, basically is what you're doing. You're using the light coming out of this, this little bit of tiny light here, to turn the other light on, is basically what you're doing. So you're using a, a little tiny fluorescent light to turn another fluorescent light on. Does that make sense? And this only happens because the energy is so minuscule and so tiny that they have to be that close for it to work. If they're a little bit too far apart, it will not work. So it's a way to say, hey, these two proteins are super close. The one problem with FRET is you have to make this fluorescent proteins. Okay, it's not like you just take protein A, protein B, put them together and work. So you have to make this idea of uh, make the fluorescent protein. Okay, now we talked about this a little bit the other day. There seemed to be a little confusion. So I'm just going to go over the idea of like how you make these fluorescent proteins real quick. So let's say you work on, I don't know, who works on a given protein? Give me a name of a protein, any protein. Anybody got a name, a protein, a given protein? Okay, I'll come up with one. What? Okay, well, GFP, yeah, we're going to use GFP, but just a, like a protein in a cell, just anything, anything. Okay, so we'll say uh, NF-kappa B, which is a transcription vector. So we'll say NF-kappa B, for instance. Okay, so if we know the genetic sequence of NF-kappa B, the DNA, and we want to be able to look at this, we can make a clone... We could take this DNA sequence of NF-kappa B and we can attach it to the, the genetic sequence of green fluorescent protein, or let's say in this case, CFP, or CFP-YFP, yeah, one of these, okay? So what this is, is you've now made a, a, an extra piece of DNA, something that doesn't occur in nature. You've taken this, this naturally occurring gene and you've now connected it to something derived from a jellyfish, the DNA. But it's all at the DNA level. This is all done at the DNA level, okay? So what happens? You take DNA, like we learned the, uh, what is it, the central dogma of biology, right? DNA gets transcribed, right? Into a messenger RNA. Right? And that messenger RNA is a hybrid. It has the signal 
for NF kappa B. It has the signal for CFP, but it's all one message. So the protein that's ultimately made is, is a protein, right, the three-dimensional structure of the protein, where a big chunk of it is NF kappa B, but it also has CFP attached to it, and that's our fluorescent molecule we use. So if your question is, hey, does NF kappa B interact with, you know, protein X or something, you'd make another one of these with protein X, so you'd have another whole protein. Genetically, you'd make it in DNA with protein X. And then part of that protein would be, say, YFP. You would then take these two proteins, or actually what you do is you'd put both DNAs in the cell. You'd let the cell make the two proteins, and then you'd see if they interact later on in the cell. Okay, so this is why I said this isn't trivial to do. Now, the one problem you can run into right away is, okay, maybe protein X and NF kappa B do interact, but maybe FRET won't work because this YFP molecule and the CFP molecule are just too big and they interfere with each other and it won't allow them to interact. So that's what I mean. FRET's a, it's a tricky process. There's a lot to it. But if everything works right, you'll get this where the donor emission is close enough to excite this. And you can measure this in a fluorescent microscope, okay? So that's the basis of FRET, how it works. But you've got to go through all this, build it correctly, you know, transfect it into cells, and make it all work. Uh, like I said, not trivial, not easy. The lab upstairs for me works with rhodopsin, which is a, the, like part of the visual cascade in the, in the retina. And they do an awful lot of variants to try to see like what types of rhodopsin, like, by, by bringing in mutations in different spots in rhodopsin, will the molecule still interact or not? So theirs is basically a study of trying to figure out how the rhodopsin molecules interact. And they use mutational studies. And they build a whole bunch of these different kind of constructs, which we call them here, to make these new proteins to see if they still interact. So an awful lot of work, an awful lot of good work they do, but you know, very time consuming, very tricky. OK, again, a couple of the pairs, different kinds of pairs for FRET. And again, if they're super close, it'll work. If they're not super close, it'll never work. So I guess step A would be, like we talked about, if two proteins co-localize, then it might be worth doing FRET. If two proteins don't co-localize, why would you even bother to do FRET, right? I mean, why bother? OK. So basically, FRET can be used to test whether two molecules that are co-localized actually interact with one another. So when they get this close, at this angstrom level, then you could assume they probably interact with one another. Uh, if another molecule Y is also very close, that can also be excited? And so on and so on. No. No. Unless, you, unless Y has a tag on it, it won't work. You have to have the two, you have to have the system set up where you have a fret pair to make this work. Yeah. If you wanted to test Y, you could bring in Y. Like, you'd have to build another one with, like, say, maybe YFP stuck to it. But you'd have to create that molecule. It's not like Y is just going to excite on its own. You have to build it into the system. Right. That's where it becomes so tricky and complicated. Because you have to actually create new proteins to even start the experiment. Does that make sense? Right. But you could do it with Y. You just have to build it into there. And then your question might be to X and Y. So then you'd use the fret pair to make X and Y go together. How do we know that like, uh, if uh, two molecules are working together, is uh, the marker molecules are interacting, interfering with that? So then how do we distinguish between that? Well, you, if you get fret and you do everything right, then they are so close that they're most likely interacting. I mean, I guess you can't ever say 100%, but they're, they're almost for certain interacting. The, what we used to do in the old days, so I think I get that out of the next one. Uh, okay, so like I said, FRET can be hard, it can be tricky, uh, you know, get another lab. But in the old days, what we used to do, we used to do something called co immunoprecipitation. Okay? Yes, exactly. You, you, it's, it's right. Because anytime in science you want to publish something, you show it one way, and then they want to see it another way. Different techniques show the same thing. So yeah, so the answer would be 
that yes, they probably interact, but then you would do the biochemistry to say yes, they really interact. And then if you want to get crazy, you can do something like X-ray crystallography, where show at the you know at the atomic level basically they're interacting. Okay, so you can always take it another step forward, but you always want to show it two ways. But FRET definitely implies that they are, you know, they're they're right there, much better than co-localization. Okay, so what we used to do in the old days was co-immunoprecipitation because we didn't have techniques like this. So when I worked in a lab, what we would do was this. Okay. I mean, it's a little bit out of the, you know, microscopy world, but since we brought it up, let's talk about co-amino precip. Precipitation. I'm not a very good writer because I type all the time. I think so. I've sort of lost my writing skills. But do you guys write like print and cursive? You write both? Like in America, we don't teach cursive anymore. They, they quit teaching the children cursive. They teach them how to sign their name in cursive, but they don't teach them cursive anymore. They teach them how to print, and then the rest of the time they're on a computer. So okay. they just let them print. Uh, a lot of times just they print or they just use a computer. Or multiple joys, yeah, fill in the circle or something. But it's sad because, you know, I mean, I think it teaches you a lot of discipline to be able to, you know, write nicely with the curves and the crosses and other things. But but it's gone away in America. The young kids just don't know how to do it anymore. It's sort of strange because I was brought up, you know, you better write neat. Okay, anyway, co precipitation. So let's say we had NF kappa B and, say, protein X. Okay, so what we used to do is we would actually come in with an antibody against NF kappa B. And this antibody, we could either grab it on a column or put beads or whatever. So what it would do is the antibody could be used to pull all the NF kappa B down to the bottom of the tube. So we would do it in such a way like we'd, we'd put a bead on here or something, and we could then drag all this to the bottom of our tube. We could pull it out, we could run it on a western blot, and we could say, okay, you know, and then, and then probe back with this and say, okay, we got NF kappa B. So if we use an antibody against NF kappa B to pull it down to the bottom of the tube, and if protein X was stuck to it, then protein X should come down to the bottom of the tube also. So then if you take this and you run this on a western blot, and you blot back for an antibody against protein X, and it's there, then you can say, hey, these two were associated. They came down together. That's co-immunoprecipitation. So before we had the FRET and the co-localization all this, we used to do these. And I mean, I used to run hundreds of Western blots. I used to do tons of this kind of stuff trying to figure it out. So that was the way we used to do it. So again, if you did the FRET, you did this, then be like, oh, that's two points of evidence. Yes, right, then, right, right. Then you got to go find some other way to go about it. But yeah, it, it can be difficult. Because like I always tell my students in biology, you know, biology is A plus B equals C, and then the same A plus B equals D, and then sometimes it, A plus B equals 4. So, I mean, it goes all over the place. We do, you know, do an experiment triplicate, you get three different answers. I mean, it's biology. It's not, it's not analytical chemistry where A plus B every time better equals C. Okay, it's biology, it's mushy, it's, it's mushy. And what about the histone interactions we can use? Like the what? Histone interactions. Histone interactions, which are? It's only histones are interacting with histone, which one has to? Oh, okay. Oh, I think you could. You probably could set up a fret system to see if those interact or not. Is that what you're asking? No. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think anything, basically any two proteins, you could set up some kind of system like this to try to make it work. How we can tag the How what? Right, because you're making that clone. You'd have to build that clone. So you'd have to take that DNA sequence of histone 1, and then cloning, you'd have to attach like the CFP 
to it. And then you'd have to actually make the clone of histone 2 and then attach the, the DNA sequence for, say, YFP. And then you'd have to put, you know, make the clones, transfect them into the cell, get the mRNAs made, get the proteins made, and then see if they interact. So it's a lot of work. So that's why I said it's, it's like, a lot of times I, I tell people, you know, unless you're really going to go for this and, and really do it and you really need that answer, you know, uh, then try something else because it's hard. And there's no other way around it. It's hard. It's a lot of work. Suppose H3, I can go on H3. Sure. That can give a spatial separation or they are very close. But if H1 transfers emission to H2, H2 transfers emissions to H3 and, and goes on or from the H1 to H4. Okay. Now, I'm not saying you can't do that. I've never seen that. I, there, it could be out there. But I've only seen fret like as pairs, like working with two things at once, not one, two, three. I've never seen it like that. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. I don't know everything that's out there. But I've only seen it with pairs, like two proteins at a time. Because you got to remember that that emission coming off this is so tiny that it's, yeah, it's just, it's very tiny. That's why they have to be so close for it to work. Okay. I mean, it's a cool technique, but, you know, it, it's, because I had a guy, I mean, right before I left, he, he wrote me a real nice email from Department of Engineering, they wanted to look at if one subunit of a protein interacted with another subunit of a protein, and he wanted to use FRET and kind of give him some protocols, and we could do it, can we do this next week? I was like, uh, no. I, I said, you are way beyond my skill level here, way beyond my knowledge level. So I gave him the name of the gentleman in Virginia. I said, you better talk with him because you're already way beyond what I know, and I can't help you. Yeah, as long as the CFP and YFP can get close enough to work, it can work. Well, no, because remember, the big protein is still only going to have one CFP stuck to it or one YFP stuck to it. So it's not like there's more of it. Well, I mean, there could be because you could have a whole bunch from there. But I mean, as long as it get close enough, it should work. I mean, I'm no expert on FRET. Don't get me wrong. I've done it, but I am by no means an expert. Okay. Okay, so I'd like to, you know, acknowledge on this part of thanks, or thank on this part of the talk, uh, Ann Kenworthy from uh, Vanderbilt. Again, she was at that microscope workshop I took back in 2012, and, and she talked a lot about the fret. A lot of the other stuff I put in, but uh, I got a lot of the fret from her lecture at that quantitative fluorescence microscopy uh, uh, project or workshop. All right. Any questions? Yes. How do we analyze it? Well, it's basically we're, we're again, we're going to use the, the emission and excitation. So it's actually like a formula. I mean, like a top med, I'm not real familiar with it. But in metamorph, there's a way. First, you take a picture of the acceptor. Then you take a picture of the wavelength of the donor. And then you take it with the acceptor off. I mean, it's, it's like a, a step, a series of steps. And then what it does is it unscrambles the math and it tells you if it worked or not. Okay, but it's actually a lot of pictures. And I mean, I haven't done it in quite a while, but metamorph, you're actually taking like a series of pictures of the CFP, a series of just the donor, and it like puts it all together and it, it gives you the answer if it worked or not. Okay, so it's a lot of different pictures. Yes, it, it's sort of like that. But what it does, it looks at the intensity readouts and decides if that overlaps there or not. Okay. Like I said, I've done it, and I've done it more in a generic way where I punch the different coordinates in, the, the different pictures, and I let it do its thing. But you're actually taking images, and it's looking at intensities, and it's looking at an overlap, and it's able to give you an answer if it worked or not. Okay. Questions? Any other questions? Right. The exact role of fret? It's protein protein interaction. It's it pretty much proves that those two proteins interact if you can get it to work. 
That's the whole idea of FRET, is to show that, yes, it's a protein-protein interaction. Like I said, old days we did co-immunal precipitations was all we had, but now FRET's like the next level. Because then you could, you could, you know, you could imagine you could put in a drug or something that would break that interaction. So you might have a FRET positive, add something that prevents those two from coming together. So that could be the experiment to show, hey, they, now they don't FRET. Now we can prevent that interaction. So we can maybe stop that signaling cascade or something like that. Okay. But like I said, it's not trivial. You don't just tomorrow, oh, let's do fret. It's, you really got to think it through. I think out of all the techniques I've talked about so far, it's probably the, I think my personal opinion, the trickiest. But I'm just asking, when we actually uh, try to mod modify the whole facility, like you know, we have, we have to have different, right. different uh, commands or one thing we can no, do. I think, for right. example, uh, TERF I have seen where uh, they need a very sophisticated room where they don't want any kind of smallest vibrations. Yeah, that's yes, a yes. So that right. facility needs for Right, right, because most microscope facilities are on the bottom floor yeah. or the basement. So where it's less vibration, like you're saying. Then you put them on vibration isolation tables and things like that, too. But, yeah, but, but I mean, I think if I was here, just what I'd see, I think I'd just buy another, first thing I'd probably buy would just be another wide field, uh, just regular microscope, probably. Because then you got more people using it and stuff. And, you know, if they make mistakes and they, I mean, I wouldn't say break things, but if they hurt things a little bit, then it's not like they're hurting a confocal, yeah, and they can learn stuff. No yeah, anyway, so. yeah, that might not be bad. Mm -hmm. And then, and then maybe get one with, get one with a, get one with a color camera on it, okay. so they could take H and E slides and mm -hmm. pictures like that, or oil red or things like that. And because you can get cameras that'll do both, camera that can do fluorescence and a camera that can do uh, H and E or color, color. Okay. So you can get that camera that does both because then you've got the ability to do a lot of different things with that. That's all my cameras are like that. I can do color or I can do fluorescence mm -hmm. on mine, which is nice because I never know what's coming. Yeah, the Just like here, you don't know what's, you don't know what's coming. You, know, you don't know what people are going to bring you. So. I know, but still, like, you know, for this, uh, like, you know, for the postgraduate students and for the scholars, I think uh, we need fluorescent microscopy. Right, so, right, yeah. right. I think it's a good place to start. Yeah. So, and then, you know, for a grassroot, we can use this. Right. This kind of techniques, I don't think we will have no, much demand. No, no. But like I said, I just want to introduce them so they are aware. Oh, there are opportunities like right. that. Because they might, you know, they might really need to do it. Might do it one time in their life, but, you know, go to Bangalore or something and do yeah, it. Yeah, they can do it there, right? Right, right. Because the same thing with us. We don't, I mean, we have them on our campus, but we're a really pretty good-sized research institute. But still, even some of the techniques we have to go out of town to do because we just we yeah, can't afford be it. Either. Right. Because everybody, somebody is doing it all the time. Right. You know, just do one more experiment is not a big right. deal. But you know, we right. have to build up everything just for one right. experiment. I don't think it is worth. Right. Because especially when you get like, because a lot of times you'll see like departments in the United States, that the department will be like people doing fairly similar kind of research. Mm -hmm. So you buy a piece of equipment that might be sort of odd for a place like this, but but if the department's all doing the same kind of work. Then, like, if they're studying membrane dynamics, you'd buy a really yeah, nice FRAP setup because everybody in the department's going to use it. So, yeah, that's basically what it comes down to. But, I, like I said, I always like simple first. I like simple things yeah. to look first and then, then worry about more advanced. So, I guess you could show a little bit of protein here. Actually, they both come back to the same spot, but it's not as good as something like this, like FRAP, where you show they really interact. But it would give you a hint that they're coming back to the same area, I guess. But, again, I'm sort of ignorant of that whole thing, so don't quote me on that. But I have seen to color before. Send molecules together or we have to adjust the distance between the two by using some linger or? No, no, so, oh, yeah, that's where it gets tricky. Sometimes you do need a little bit of a linker, sometimes you don't. That's where it becomes trial and error and having somebody with experience to tell you what to do. Okay. Right, I mean, I've never, I've never actually gone through the whole process of starting with the DNA and gone through and done the whole thing. But I've heard of, you know, sometimes you have to come with the linker to keep it a little farther away or whatever, so. Yeah, that's where it's nice to talk to somebody who's an expert who can really help you design the setup to see if it works. Okay, so that's where it would be. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, but can be read using fluorometer? Or yeah, I've seen that. Yeah, Lab Upstairs does it with the fluorometer, right? 96 good plate. plate. Uh, something like that, yeah. I can't say exactly what they do, but they do it in a plate format. So, yeah, so you could do it that way too. I've seen that. These, so you're, you would build the construct with CFP and YFP 
would be the would be one pair you could use. You could use this as a pair, but you'd have to build the one molecule with this and the one molecule with this. They have to be put together, transfected into the cell, and then the proteins made inside the cell, and then see if it goes together or not. Okay, based upon which, based upon which criteria you uh, you say that this is the best one. Uh, I don't know if that's the best one now, but this is sort of a standard one I've seen a lot. Okay. okay. There might be something better now, but I've seen this one a lot. I've done that one. So I know it works, but there, there, there's, there's always things better. And I haven't done FRET in a few years, so I wouldn't be surprised if there's something better now. But, but that will work. Okay.